Our study this morning is 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 through verse 12. Wonderful, wonderful communion study. Would you read along with me, please? Beloved. Now, I know your 84 NIV says, dear friends, but that's horrible. It's beloved. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. If you have a King James or a New King James, he has the word propitiation in there. It's a business term. The deal is done. He sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, since God so loved us, we also ought, and please highlight the ought too there, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete or perfect in us. Father, we've come here today because we want your perfect and your complete love in us. And we want to be a blessing to those around us. Teach us today, O God, as we prepare our hearts to come to the table to celebrate the sacrifice you made. Teach us to be sacrifice, uh, a sacrificial in our love for you by loving others, even those that are difficult to love. There's anyone in this second service, Lord, or anybody coming into the next service if they don't know you, if they're not yet born again, prepare their hearts to hear just how wide and high and deep and long your love for them is. Convince us, O oh God, that you love us. As we come to your table, may we come with truly grateful and abundant hearts. We love you, we thank you, we honor you, Lord, in your beautiful and glorious name we pray. Amen. This doesn't happen to me often, but I woke up with a song in my mind this morning, and I called Paula and I said, Paula, by any chance are you doing this particular song on worship? I never know what songs the worship team is going to do. And, and she said, no. And I had this song and it just wouldn't go away. It was, it's, it's one that we do here fairly often. It's all about you. It's not about me. And it dawned on me that the Lord was speaking in my heart about this Bible study because it really is not about you. I've exhorted you often to get over yourselves, especially before you come to church, because we're coming here to be a sacrifice to others. Let me give you an example. Are you willing to be used by God? Some years ago, we had a woman come in. She was in her mid to late 30s, and we didn't know her. She'd never been here before. And you know how Paula is before service. She's just talking to everybody, and during the meet and greet time, she's taking names and taking pictures and, and just making people feel welcome. And she went to this one woman, and the woman wasn't all that responsive. And Paula just began praying for her. God put this woman on her heart. And then during the service, the Lord spoke to Paul's heart about that woman. He said, when service is over and she gets up to leave, I want you to chase her out to the parking lot. And I want you to get on a knee and propose marriage to her. Now, we'd never seen this woman before. How would you respond if the Lord said that to you? <laughs> I think most of us say, oh, that's the devil. That's not the Lord at all. But the, the, the impression was so heavy on Paula's heart. And as soon as the service was over, she got up and started looking. And sure enough, that young woman got up out of her seat and started to sort of beat the crowd out, as sometimes we are wont to do. And Paula dutifully she went out. And with a lot of people around, this wasn't a show that she was putting. She just couldn't avoid the people. With a lot of people, she took this woman's hand, got down on a knee, and she said, Jesus wants me to propose marriage to you. He loves you, and he wants to marry you. Now, the woman was sort of put off by a little bit, as you might imagine. First time in this church, and why are these weird kind of things <laughs> happening? But you know what? This woman came back a couple of weeks later, and she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Now, here's what we didn't know, 
it would be a year or so from that moment that this woman would be diagnosed with a terminal cancer. She would live another almost two years suffering through the treatment and, and the, the effects of the illness. And we didn't know anything about any of that, of course. But this woman got saved and she used the time that she had left. She was serving here, she was serving others, and God really, really touched her heart. What I didn't communicate to you is that Paula also didn't know that she was actively living a gay lifestyle. And she repented of all of that. She gave her heart to Jesus Christ and became an integral part of the body of Christ. And then she graduated and she went to heaven. Love that is real, and we're going to see that only God gets to define love. Love that's real is sacrificial. I won't sing the song, I'll spare you the pain, but it's not about you, it's all about Jesus. And what he wants to do is use you to allow other people who are hurting, who are in pain, who are suffering horrible consequences of things in their lives. He wants those people to be able to see who he is through you. Now, we're going to read that, that no one has seen God. We can't see Jesus. He's in heaven. He's at the right hand of his Father. That's the power hand. But we can't see him. But what John is saying here is that he can be seen through your life and through my life as we minister to others. But in order for that to happen, it can't be about you at all. I've said before that I think the single most difficult statement in the Bible to really believe, and I'm talking about genuine Christians, it's when Jesus said, if you find your life, you'll lose it. I mean, we've been raised to find our life, to find a purpose and find a mission. But he says, if you lose your life for me, you'll find it. And I think the Apostle John is asking in this passage, I'm asking in this Bible study today for you to trust God enough to lose your life and be willing to sacrifice if that's what's necessary for the benefit of someone else. Do you trust that God will take care of you? When you lose who you are and you really find who he is, do you have enough faith to believe that you won't miss out on anything in this world? And in fact, your life will be richer and fuller than ever before. I'm going to let the Apostle John convince you. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Now, church tradition, with some um, validation, suggests that the Apostle John, the only one of the original 12 who, who lived a full life, all the others died the death of a martyr, Jesus kept John around, and by all accounts, he lived to be more than 100 years old. Now, that's old in 2024. Imagine what it was like back then. He was just this ancient relic, but John was a rock star. I mean, imagine the people in the first century church, and they're, they're just, John, the apostle, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's here, and every time John would appear somewhere, throngs of people would crowd around him because they wanted to hear him. They just wanted to be where he was. And toward the end of his life, he was so weak that he had to be carried in and propped up before he could say anything at all. And his message at the end of his life was always the same one. Six words... Beloved, let us love one another. That's all he said. One young man in particular was so excited to be around John and he would hear him from time to time and he asked him one day when he had the opportunity, he said, well, why do you always say the same thing? Why do you preach the same message? And John simply answers, because if you love one another, that is sufficient. That's how he became known as the Apostle of Love. He was a one-string guitar. And we need to sing in tune to that one-string guitar. Beloved, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Now it follows, if God is the source of love, the only source of love, then God also defines what love is. The world that we live in has all kinds of definitions of love. We certainly have differing degrees of love. I mean, I say all the time, Paula, I love you. But the truth is, I love Paula and I love donuts. 
Certainly not the same way nor to the same degree. But you see, we've got these different measures of love. God only has one force of love, and it's like hurricane force all the time. His love is infinite. And what we need to understand is he loves you that way, and he loves me that way. And Romans 5, 5 says that love of God has been poured out into our hearts, and that means we need to love others with that same force of love. It's not an option. It's not a choice that we have. It is a mandate. The Apostle Paul said that I am a debtor to both Greek and Jew. I'm compelled to preach the gospel. Woe to me if I don't declare the gospel of God. That ought to be the force of love working in us and then through us to others for every single man and woman in this room who is born again. God's love has only one speed our love needs to mimic his love. And that's why he says everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. What he's saying here is it's almost like our born-again birthmark. If you see somebody who's willing to be sacrificial in their love for others, if you see somebody who is just known for the magnanimity and the, the love that they have, well, it's easy to say, well, that person must be a Christian. John is saying that if we love other people, that's the outlet that God has given us. It'd be great if we could stand before Jesus, and we will one day, and say, oh, I love you, I love you, but we can't see him, so the way we love him is to love people, even the unlovable. Now, what John is doing here is returning to the essential doctrine of loving one another, and he's so forceful that love if I've counted correctly, and I think I have, I did it three times, love in the rest of this chapter is mentioned 29 times. It's almost like John is saying to us with that one string guitar, love one another, love one another. And the idea is if you aren't loving other people, how would anybody know that you love God and that God loves you? It's obviously important enough to be repeated and in the context of our last study, and that's important, John wants us to discern the spirits. Remember the Gnosticism heresy. And these are men who are claiming that they have God's validation. We'll see later that they, they are claiming that they've seen God. God has appeared to them. And John is simply saying, that's not love at all because God alone defines what love is. False teachers, he says, are not lovers of the brotherhood of believers, and thus they don't know God. Now, the world that we live in, and we're all familiar with what's out there, we understand the pressure, we understand the persuasion of the world that we live in to get us to conform to their image of love. Love is, well, if two people want to love each other and they're the same gender, what difference does it make? It's supposed to be okay. But, but John is simply asking the question, is it loving to accept somebody who's living a lifestyle, to accept that lifestyle, when we know that lifestyle is going to condemn them to an eternity separated from God? Is that loving? I would suggest it's not loving at all. I would also suggest that the most loving thing we can do, remember this born-again birthmark, if we really love people, we have to tell them the truth in love. And if we know there are consequences that they can't even begin to imagine, if we know that they're going to face that, it's our responsibility to introduce them to the only one who gets to define love. The world may say, if people love each other, it's okay, but, but, but remember the varying degrees of love. Who do we love? Do we love God enough to say, what you're doing is wrong, it's sin, and God hates it, but he loves you, and he wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to wipe your slate clean and give you a whole new start in the world that we live in. Parents are told that if they don't accept their children's decisions, whether they're homosexual lifestyles or transgender lifestyles, well, then your child is going to be sad and he or she is going to commit suicide. And, that, you know, that strikes at our heart. That is the hiss of Satan. And we're told that we must affirm and approve those lifestyle choices. Is it loving to accept a lifestyle choice, your children, that's going to condemn them to an eternity in hell? 
John is simply saying we've got to make a choice. And remember last week, test the spirits. Not every spirit is from God. There is a lying spirit out there that says, no, the only thing that matters is love. So let's just open our arms and accept everybody. We want to accept everybody, but we need to tell everybody the truth in love. Because if we don't, we're demonstrating that we don't love God, nor do we even know personally the love of God. Our point of view is going to be determined either by the world that we live in or by the God whom we serve as given to us in the word of God. So he says in verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now God isn't just love, he's more than love. But certainly love is one of his overarching characteristics, his attributes. But so too is holiness and so too is justice. And we're going to see how important a part that plays in this passage of Scripture. God proved it. Look at verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Now, every time we read that, there was a line in the song, his very body began to breathe. Can you imagine that? That really got me when they sang that today. His very body began to breathe. That was a dead man in that tomb. And can you imagine what that first breath was like? He was alive. Well, that was because God loved you, and he loved me so much that he sent his one and only son. We all know John 3.16, the same author wrote that, quoting Jesus. But do we really understand? Or do we let it sort of go in one ear and out the other over our head? We hear it so often, yeah, I know, God sent his son to die for my sins. But, but it's so important he did that so that we can live for him. We live through him, certainly, but we also live for him. Jesus begged his father. On three occasions in the Garden of Gethsemane, he begged his father to let this cup pass. Father, if there's any way this cup can pass, any way, if there's another way to accomplish our goal, and three times the father said no, there isn't a man or a woman in this room who would sacrifice our children for other people, for strangers. But God demonstrated his love palpably. While we hated him, Paul writes, he died for the ungodly. And one of the things that I hope this cements in your heart and in your brain is the issue of whether or not God loves you. You know, we go through a tough time, we get a bad medical report. We, God, if you love me, why would this be happening? I want you to sell once and for all that he loves you. And he proved that by giving the thing that was the most valuable to him, his only son, who lived a perfect life. He didn't do anything to upset his father. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And yet he sacrificed him. And he did that for you and for me. Remember discerning the spirits, testing the spirits from last week? Every time you think, well, God, if this was, if you loved me, this shouldn't happen. Understand where that spirit comes from and deal with it. The issue needs to be settled once and for all. And that's why he says this is love. And I have in my Bible real love or authentic love, God's love. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his sons as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Again, the King James and New King James says a propitiation. But propitiation is simply a business term. You and I, we owed a debt to God, a sin debt. We couldn't pay it. And Jesus paid it for us. A debt that we couldn't pay was cleared. The books were cleared because he loved us. What this is telling us is that love has to be characterized by sacrifice a sacrifice for the benefit of others. When the Lord spoke to Paul's heart and said, go out and propose marriage to that young woman, that's a hard thing. I mean, how would you process that? And probably the whole time you're doing it, you'd feel silly like everybody was watching you. But you see, that young woman 
God knowing her future, God knowing the difficulty that she was going to encounter, he loved her so much to chase her. And he used Paula to do it. Well, in the same way, God wants to use you to chase others. Now, not like that, so don't think that he's going to ask you to do a bunch of weird stuff. But every one of us should be open every day to weird stuff. When you're talking with someone, you ought to be praying, Lord, is there something that you want to say to this person? Is there something I can say to this person that will encourage him or encourage her? Can I be a blessing when I'm up here as the worship team is finishing the last song and I'm looking out at you? One of my last thoughts is, Lord, let what I have to say be a blessing to people today. No matter the sacrifice, are you willing to sacrifice your wants, your desires, even your needs for the benefit of others. Remember, if you find your life, you'll lose it. If you lose it for Jesus, you'll find it. And somehow we've got to find the faith to really believe that's true. And the only way that we can ever do that is to really know who Jesus is. Real love, authentic love, is that our love is sacrificial. It's one of the reasons God tells men, husbands, to love your wives the way Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. In 2024, in English, that translation is, put her needs ahead of yours. You say, well, if I do that, then what am I going to do? Where am I going to get fulfillment? Or where am I going to have fun? Do you really believe Jesus when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all those other things will be added unto you? That's what genuine, authentic love looks like. It's a love that is poured out for others. It's also why the fellowship of believers is so important, so valuable. Because this is the place that you minister to others. First, you get equipped to minister to others, to show the love of God. But you also have the opportunity. You know, the Christian who's sitting at home and watching online, and don't take this personal, but that person is saying he can't do or she can't do anything for us. There might be somebody that God wanted to send them after another person. And because they're not in the right place, they're not where they can be used. This is where God uses your gifts. This is the reason that God uses uh, or gives you his gifts of the Spirit. So that you can minister to others. Now, I'm not going to lecture you, but every one of us ought to be here multiple services every Sunday serving. Every Sunday. Why? Because that's God's intention. That's the sacrificial love that he demonstrated for us. Is he asking too much of us if he asks us to give up our ideas or our wants, our needs? Jesus took the wrath of God for you. Now, a word about atonement here because it is falling out of favor in the world that we live in, in the church world, unfortunately, that we live in. Um, you know, people don't like to think of God as being an angry God. God is love, but God is also angry at sin. And he's angry at sin because he knows that sin separates us from him. And so he hates sin. And if we don't communicate that to people, we're not telling them the truth. That means we're not loving them. But God, because he's also holy, and because he's just, he has to punish sin. And we've developed a church culture, especially here in the West, where we think, okay, well, saved by grace, Jesus loves me, died for my sins, and we, we kind of translate that into meaning, well, he just overlooks my sin. How many times have you talked to somebody about their sin and say, well, God understands me, God knows my heart. I'm going to heaven because I believe in Jesus, but they're living a sinful, willfully sinful life. And we look at Jesus on the cross as, well, you know, that sort of covers everything. And there's no responsibility on my part. Jesus died. He suffered for you. And he took the wrath of God. You know, one of the most fascinating things to think about when it comes to the Lord's sacrifice for us is that on the cross, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin that we might become the righteousness or the perfection of God. He became sin. He didn't just die for our sins. It wasn't like there was a list of all the horrible stuff that I've done and he checked off all those things. Okay, Ron, you're covered. Next! He didn't do that. He became sin. The worst, the most vile things that we've ever done, Jesus actually became those things. 
And that's why the wrath of God, the anger of God against sin, was poured out on Jesus Christ. You want to know how horrible it was for him? We need only to read the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 18. All of the judgments, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the vial or bowl judgments, as horrible as they are, we read them and it sickens our stomach. We have no ability to even imagine how horrible that is. Well, all of that was poured out on Jesus. The same one of whom the Father spoke, this is my Son in whom I will please. He poured out that wrath on his Son so to spare you and me having to be the object of his wrath. That's how holy God is. Yes, God is love. And he demonstrates love by sending his Son but make no mistake, God is angry at sin for you and for me. That's the heart that we take into the world. Jesus Christ is the remedy for sin. There is no other. And that's why we need to be forceful. We need to be loving. We need to be kind. But we do need to be direct and we need to be truthful. And the way we do that is simply say, like me, you owe God a debt you can't pay. All you have to do is believe, repent of your sin. People will get angry. Remember I said real love is sacrificial. You may become the object of somebody else's anger. You may be canceled in the world that we live in. You may lose friends and family members who don't want anything to do with you any longer. But you see, that's a sacrificial love. Are you willing to pay the price of being uncomfortable, even being disliked, even being hated? because you love God who loved you. And so he says, Beloved, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now this means we have no choice. The word ought, it's the same word that Jesus used after washing the feet of his disciples. Peter, you know, the whole thing, you're not going to wash my feet, then, then you have no part of me. Okay, Lord, Lord wash all of me. And Jesus said, no, you're already clean by the word that is spoken. Just your feet are dirty you're walking in this world. But I've done this, Jesus said, and you ought, same Greek word, you ought to do likewise for others. Again, the importance of fellowship. What God has done for you, you need to be doing to the body of believers. Again, it's not a choice. It's not a suggestion. It is a command. Those of us who have received God's love are compelled to mete out that love for others, even at your own cost. This morning, I've been in Paris this weekend, and uh, Paris, Texas. <laughs> but, but I did get to see the Eiffel Tower. It was really unimpressive. In fact, in Paris, Texas, they have a cowboy hat on the top of the uh, Eiffel Tower. <laughs> And, and it's, so my whole routine is off. I got here this morning uh, on the, the days that Paul is singing on the worship team. We get here early. We're here a little after 7 o'clock. And, and it's, it's, they can rehearse and get things ready. Um, and, and so I, I'm walking, just walking through. Now there's a couple of men already here. Sunday morning, really early. They're watching things. They're helping people prepare things. So I walk in. They're sitting in the foyer. And I just walk in there. I wasn't even talking to them. And I did that. I thought, oh, I left my Ricolas at home. They're throat lozenges, and I, I just need them. Oh, I left them at home. I didn't say anything else. I went into an office, looked to see if there was some in there, another office, and there was none. I said, oh. And so I just, well, they heard that. The next thing I know, they're running to CVS at 7 o'clock in the morning to get them for me. Knocked on my door, and he had them. Are these okay? Nobody asked them to do that. But that's just one of the ways, a small way, but, but nonetheless, one of the ways that we understand that others come before us. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, later in this chapter, we're going to read that we love God because he first loved us. 
So even the sacrifice is compelled by the gift of love that we've been given, but we have to love other people. And that's been a constant theme throughout our study in 1 John. And then he says, no one has ever seen God. Now that's a statement that has a dual purpose. First, he wants us to know the false teachers, the, the Gnostics. They're claiming not only divine inspiration for their heresy, but they're claiming that God has appeared to them. We have people, false teachers, that claim God appears to them all the time. It's like a routine thing. Oh, yeah, I'm one of God's favorites. Shows up in my bedroom at night. He speaks to me, gives me encouragement, makes sure everything is going well. We have people telling those lies. Remember, test the spirits because not every spirit is from God. And John is simply saying to those people that claim God has appeared to them, John is saying, nah, no one has seen God, period. And this statement often causes confusion because we can read our Bibles and people see God all the time, or so it seems. And so the question is, what does he mean by no one has ever seen God? Now, we've got to take the statement at face value. No one has ever seen God, that's clear. We can go to Exodus chapter 33, a great chapter, by the way, right after the golden calf incident, when you think God would say, you know what, I'm going to put them on a timeout. I don't want to talk to them for a while. But when he sees what Moses has done, and he asks Moses to make a sacrifice, Moses responds by saying, God, show me your glory. We sing that song. Show me your glory. Now, we don't have this recorded in Exodus 33, but God laughed. He says, no, no, no one can see God and live. Moses, if, if you saw my glory, you'd be toast. So what he did, he had Moses get way back in the, in the cave, in the, in the very, very back parts of a cave. He said, cover your face. I'm going to let the backside of my glory, or the afterglow, I'm going to let that pass by. And that was so powerful, it changed Moses' visage. But no one has seen God, including Moses. In Exodus chapter 33, John's own gospel maintains that no one has seen God. John chapter 1, verse 18. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, Paul writes this, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Invisible. Nobody has seen God. Paul adds in the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy that God lives in unapproachable light and whom no one has seen or can ever see. You really want something to be grateful for? God lives in unapproachable light. And yet through Jesus, we're told to approach the throne of God with confidence. Every single day day we can approach God with confidence but but wait a minute he lives in unapproachable light well you figure it out Jesus is the one that bridges that gap you might ask the question well how can God be known if no one can see him Philip asked that question when Jesus was convinced or had convinced his disciples that he really was going to die Philip in a state of confusion I personally think Jesus was having some fun with Philip but he said, well, 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 Lord, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough. You say everything's going to be fine, but show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And, and Jesus, I think, laughed. But then he said this. He said, Philip, have you been with me for so long, and you still don't know that if you've seen me, you have seen the Father? If you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. The Father is spirit. That's what Jesus told the woman at the well in Samaria. We can't see the spirit realm. It's invisible to us. However, we know it's true. Isaiah. I've had people actually argue that Isaiah saw him. I saw the Lord high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. Isaiah was undone. But in John chapter 12, in the 41st verse, John, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this had to be thrilling to John, but he said, Isaiah saw Jesus' glory. So Jesus came to ensure that we could see who God is. He came to reveal the person of the Father. He came in the flesh, 
in order for man to see God at all. Very important thing to remember, Jesus is the only way. If Jesus didn't come as a man, that's the Gnostic heresy, then nobody has ever seen God. But he did come, he did die, and he did rise from the dead. And through Jesus we can see the Father. All of the appearances of God in the Old Testament were called theophanies or Christophanies, pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus as the definite article, angel of the Lord. Every one of those was Jesus. Hail, mighty warrior. Can you imagine how surprised Gideon was? He saw Jesus. You and I can see the Lord. No one can see God, but we can see him by looking at Jesus. And then he says this, and this is sort of an advertisement to the world. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Some translations say made perfect in us. The idea is that because the world can't see God, the only way they can see God is through you and through me. And that's sort of our mandate, our prime directive, until he comes again. And as you know, I tell you, week after week, he's coming soon. It's our mandate to make sure that people who look at us see God. We love them. We make sacrifices for them. We go out of our way to minister to them. We set aside our needs and put their needs and their desires ahead of our own. That's the whole point of this passage of Scripture. You can't see God, but other people can see God through your life. As you come to the table of communion, ask that question. Honestly examine, Lord, are people looking at me? When I get up in the morning, is my song, it's all about me. That's kind of the tune, isn't it? Okay, it's all about me. But, but Jesus said, but, but it's not about you. And he wants your sacrificial love to be his love letter to the lost, the hurting, the hungry, the broken, the needy, the confused. He wants to use you and he wants to use me. That's how the church grew from the beginning in the first century church as they met together. It says every day, Acts chapter 2, verse 46, they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, and here's the key, and enjoying the favor of all the people, believers and unbelievers alike. Why? Because for the first time, the unbelieving world was seeing God with their own eyes. They were experiencing it for themselves. That young woman who is now with the Lord the day she came here, and why she came, we have no idea. But through Paula, she saw the love of God. On her knee, Paula said, Jesus wants me to propose marriage to you. Now, I don't know what it's like for you, but that's risky. But she saw God's love. And that's what he wants every one of us to understand. That's how his love is made perfect or complete in us. We come to the table of communion. He showed us how much he loved us. Now he wants us to love others with the love we ourselves have received from God. Let's pray. Would the ushers come forward and prepare the elements? Father, we thank you so much for considering us so valuable. <clears throat>